بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In name of Allah, your excellencies, our dear guests, good morning. In name of His Excellency Jamal Sanad Swaidi, Director General, Emirates Center for Strategic Studies, I would like to welcome you today in this symposium regarding the security of the Gulf. And now we will start with the welcoming note from His Excellency Jamal Sanad Swaidi, the Director General of ECSSR, and Mr. Burad Al Belushi will say it on his behalf. In the name of Allah, Your Excellencies, our dear guests, our dear attendants, good morning for you all. First, I would like to welcome you here in the SCSSR in this symposium talking about the security of the Gulf, identifying confronting the challenges, which will take different issues with different dimensions. First, I would like to welcome all the different thinkers and researchers who will discuss the different challenges that has impact on the security of the Gulf countries and its future and that also will continue to impact on the national and international stage. As you know, the importance of the location of the GCC countries and how it governs the different trade routes and has got great impact in the energy sector. Our dear attendees, the GCC area facing different challenges that have impact on its flourishing on security level. There is a worry and concern because of the problem between USA and Iran and that can have and have impact on the stability of the region, especially there is escalation in the recent months. In addition to that, some countries, Arab countries, they have different crises after the Arabic Spring. And that enabled some regional forces to intervene in the different matters for some countries in order to have more power in the region. In addition to that, the different terrorism challenges that they are working very hard to exploit different opportunities to force their agendas and interests. Security and geopolitical challenge. GCC countries they are facing also different challenges regarding the economical development and also food security and water security. Our dear attendees, UAE understands fully and deeply the importance of GCC security and for that UAE is working very hard to achieve stability and also to have good relations with the different neighbors. These challenges we are facing on the security or developmental level need to be discussed and studied in order to face. Depending on that, our symposium today will discuss different topics regarding the Gulf security and identifying and confronting the challenging. We will talk about the maritime and also we will talk about the Iranian crisis. We will talk also about the different developmental regarding the food security and also the energy transformation. And also we will discuss how to solve the Qatari crisis 
and the impact of different aliens on this region. At the end of my speech, I would like to thank you very much and I wish all the participants to have useful time. You are welcome in the UAE. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for His Excellency Jamal Sanad Suwaidi for this speech and now for the keynote, keynote speaker by His Excellency Dr. Anwar Gargash, the Minister of State for Foreign Affairs, United Arab Emirates. Your Excellency, floor is yours. Peace be upon you, our guests. In the name of Allah, the Merciful, the Compassionate, Your Excellencies, Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, our attendees, good morning to all of you, and may Allah bless you all. I have a great pleasure to participate in the, this symposium, and at the beginning, I would like to thank uh, the efforts of uh, Mr. Dr. Suwedi for presenting all what he can to explore the future. And I would like also to thank the, e, the Emirates Center for Strategic uh, Studies Research and Research for arranging the symposium with this topic and theme that, re uh, very, that is very relevant to the region. And it is part of, our, of the uh, efforts of the center to enrich the information sphere in all its dimensions, political, economic, etc. The security of the Gulf area was and will, st will stay as the center of attraction for all coast areas in this region along this vital waterway. It receives uh, regional and international importance. The, the trade size of this and this area is 1.2 trillion, and it goes through the Hermos Strait. And through this strait, also 20% of the oil, of the international oil trade goes through this strait. And we, from, based on this, we are in an area where the interests of different countries meet, and we, at the geopolitical, seen we represent an important issue and we have also different issues and we have the international uh, countries here where they meet and co cooperate and work and this area is an international uh, it is for the world the Arab world security and here for a long time we find that the Security Council ex exceeds the countries along the coast. And so when we talk about the security we are not of this area, we are not talking about a closed uh, water area. We are talking about a vital area in the international uh, order. Also, we talk, when we talk about the base here, that's the fundamental issue that the area security of this area faces international challenges and critical issues. So. It's always that the case, but uh, security, peace, and safety is temporal. The file in this area meet is relevant to this area, and we meet challenges today, the challenges we meet today in light of the confrontation between America and Iran, and in the background of our political uh, background here between Iran and the region as well. It is a critical area amongst the challenges facing the, the area here, the Gulf area. We, 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 we see that this issue will, will stay with us and we have to manage it in a, in a better way until we reach a future stage where we can uh, put the basis for a better order. This symposium comes as part of the 
efforts of the center here in a critical period and an important period. It is vitally important that researchers discuss this issue and having in mind that the stability, the stability of the area and its prosperity and trying to avoid all conflicts in here so to preserve the achievements uh, we got along the in the previous years. We have some notes about the com uh, confrontation with Iran, as you know, and this is at the forefront of the international order, and the repercussions of this would ex so proceed the area here and the countries here to other ca capitals. The capitals that see in this confrontation uh, and tension uh, damage to their welfare and prosperity. I here would like to indicate that the sensitivity of this period and our efforts of this area and follow-up of what's happening here require uh, caution when dealing with this situation to keep the area away from confrontation that we are not in need of. And this Puts, uh, gives us a priority, a political priority in this area. There is no doubt that there are a number of examples in the uh, last months that show the mentality of the, pe the people in the Gulf in dealing with the, this issue. Second, this confrontation doesn't represent a logical uh, issue uh, confront, uh, dealing with it. We see that it is difficult to reach a conclusion here. The countries involved in here, they superseded that and uh, realized the, the failure of it because of Iranian uh, policies in the region. The signatory people, the countries here, they have no doubt that the Iranian nuclear program has repercussions and it doesn't also, it doesn't other sides of the regional policies. The political solution within a clear uh, road map will help the region to reach to prosperity, and that's the choice we look for. I believe that the current situation is to dismantle this confrontation and its factors. We, I believe that the following stage should, should give us a present uh, our look into the dealing with the situation and how to deal with the Iranian ballistic muscles and th their policy of interference in internal affairs. And I think this is more than any, any solution that maintains a, a solution here in the area. Third, this area should reach an understanding, a, a sustainable understanding that pr protects it from critical issues and that based on international relationships, based on non-interference and the prosperity for all. I think this framework can only be cannot be of a uh, media nature. It should also for it should have it should consider the uh, geopolitical relation issues in the area for the countries along the coast of the Gulf. That these countries should be very vital in these initiatives and efforts. And I would add that moving to this stage, we need to have uh, under understanding and trust building issues. We shouldn't be afraid of confrontation and we should seek security and we cannot achieve security without under com uh, understanding and trust building. This should be based on an international role that doesn't uh, include the Gulf countries only. Now talking in this symposium about the security in the Gulf, we should consider a number of factors 
relevant to this region and its security. The international order, the current international order is ch changing and it is multipolar and we have a new players. The fa characteristic of this uh, system is not clear and the, the sides of this and the factors are not clear, but we should take them into consideration. The nature of uh, international alliances that liberated Kuwait two decades ago was the, the, the result of an immediate situation. But today, the international the world order is different, different from that historic moment. Uh, this uh, reflects uh, worry on, on us and other areas in the world. It is not only about the Gulf area here. During the years, we had the momentum of ideology, whether it's national, the nationalism or, or religious. And the ideology and the regional co competition played uh, a major role here and in, 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 in the area to help the area. The ideology in this area and the two, the two factors There is no doubt that the ability of the countries here to cooperate and coordinate in on positions about the security file here was not historic and was not up to the challenges. And we here, we, we, we realize that there are dif differences between us when dealing with these challenges. We here, I, I have here to refer to the crisis with the, the situation with Qatar, it was a natural result of the Doha's interference policies and looking for this crisis should, would end one time, but the solution of this crisis should be based on dealing with the, with the causes of it. In the light of all of this, we think that capabilities building is very important. And this is what the United Arab Emirates is taking here. And this is out of an understanding of the international order. Building the uh, national capabilities, solid national capabilities, is very realistic. This is to, uh, tied to co collective work. And we, know, we see that the, uh, the central role is goes to uh, the kingdom Saudi Arabia. Here in the light of, uh, of regional interference in the security of the, of the region here and, and the last of which was the Turk Turkish interference, there should, we should have a clearer, we should have a clearer contact lines between the United Arab, the Gulf countries and the world. And this side will remain the weakest point, but is still in the light of what we see in changes in the world order has become a more important issue. I don't mean that, I don't mean at the military level here, but I'm talking about coordination, political coordination. In the United Arab Emirates, we see the, uh, the efforts of the United, of the Republic of Egypt and coordinate and the work of cooperation in the area. Here, when we talk about the Yemeni war and the challenges of stability in Iraq, all of this is tied to stability and security in the Gulf area. Maybe the, we see the interference of the United of the Saudi Arabia in Yemen, and we participated vitally in that one. It was a very uh, difficult decision, but a necessary one. Uh, the, re the countries of the region took to maintain its, the geopolitical strategy, balance here and maintain its security. Despite this challenge, it, it maintained the balance in the area, strategic balance here. Now we have the priorities, our priorities as enforcing, the import, uh, uh, considering the uh, solution, the political solution in the area. I hope that these, primary preliminary notes that 
uh, co constitute incentives for our discussions today. Our discussions that we see that our elites in the region should discuss and analyze. Now, we see that we are facing a major issue here and we should re realize all the aspects and dimensions of it. I hope in my, uh, that I have in my speech here have presented some elements here that will help in your discussions in, these, in your sessions. And we, our aim is to maintain our security here and maintain the successes and achievements and the stability. Thank, thank you to uh, His Excellency Dr. Kirkash on his speech. And now we have for the second speech, we delivered, we call on Dr. Her Excellency Dr. Al Mahiri. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Sabah al-Khair wa Noor wa Sarur. Ladies and gentlemen, Your Excellencies, good morning. Um, to talk about Gulf security and one of the most important pillars of security is food security. Over the years, the UAE has um, gained its food security and also many of the other Gulf countries in putting a lot of investment in the infrastructure, in ports, in airlines to make sure we are, we are ensuring volumes of food are coming into the country and therefore then making sure that the citizens have the accessibility of food. And uh, our wise leadership, they have foresight in their DNA and they understand that having this high dependency on imports is a good thing, but in future there are challenges that lie ahead that we have to be ready so that we're not just food secure today, but also in the future. Now, what is the definition of food security? So it's enabling citizens and residents to have accessibility to safe, nutritious, sufficient food for an active and healthy lifestyle at all times. And it has to be affordable too. So this is the definition of food security. Many times when I ask people what they understand with food security, many of them talk about um, agriculture or they talk about uh, strategic storages, but it's so much more than that. It's also the way we eat, what we put in the bin, um, food safety, all that lies in the umbrella of food security. Now, why is food security a global issue and why do we have to make sure we are ready for what's coming in future? We've all heard we're going to be reaching the 9 billion uh, number of people by 2050. So as population is growing, traditional farming methods are, can't keep up and therefore a food gap starts to exist. So having the food gap, and also this is exasperated by climate change effects, which we are all feeling at the moment. I don't know if you all, I mean, I, I uh, saw it myself when I was in Europe this summer. Most of the parks that are usually lush green have become yellow. So we're actually, we're feeling climate change now. And the food production uh, sector is feeling it even more. So those two challenges, plus water depletion, I mean, we are in a region where we are water scarce countries here. So we have managed our, our, uh, and, our accessibility to water through desalination. But globally, you're seeing more and more countries are, are facing desertification and water depletion. And we are connected to them through our global food supply. And I talked about another global issue, it's food loss and food waste. One third of the food that's being produced globally is going to waste. And at the same time, over 800 people, 800 million people are going to bed hungry every night. So there's a clear problem we have in the distribution. At the moment, there is enough food for all, but it's not reaching everybody. But as population grows and a traditional agriculture cannot keep up, we're going to be facing an even more problem in the future. So what do we have to do? There's two systems we have to disrupt, how we produce food and how we are consuming food. What I mean with consuming food, it's what we're actually putting in our mouths, what we're feeding our families, and what we're putting in the bin. So this is the, these are the two systems that we have to disrupt. I'm sure a lot of you have come across 
disrupting systems. So this is what we have to do in the food security domain. Now His Highness um, appointed me as the first minister in the world of food security two, two years ago. He told me three things. He said, Mariam, we need a plan, we need to adopt technology, and we need to advance R&D. So my team and I got to work. The first thing, we worked on a plan. But before starting the plan, we wanted to identify what, is, what are we eating? What is our food basket in the UAE? We have over 200 nationalities in the UAE. Everyone has their own cultures, everyone has their own tastes, their own likes. So we had to identify what is our food basket in the UAE. And therefore, we have 18 main food items. This is quite a lot compared to other countries who have a lot less, but it's because we have such a large number of nationalities and cultures and tastes in the UAE. So with that, we identified from this food basket what are the food items that we can actually grow domestically, enabled with technology, and what doesn't make sense, what's not commercially viable? In the UAE, we have grown uh, wheat before, but at what price? No one's going to buy it, it's too expensive. So there are certain foods that doesn't make sense to grow in the UAE yet. Therefore, this is the strategy. Number one, it's about facilitating agribusiness and ensuring that we are bringing foods not only from two or three countries, but we're diversifying from where we're bringing our food sources. Number two, it's about what can we grow in the UAE enabled with technology. And you'll be really proud to see that nowadays we can grow quinoa, we can grow salmon, we can grow all the vegetables. There's now berries in the market grown in the UAE. So the UAE has come a long way now in using technology to grow domestically. Reducing food loss and food waste is a pillar on its own because it has so much importance. We in the Gulf region actually have the highest uh, food loss and food waste uh, percentage. So we have to work really hard to ensure that we cut this by 50% by 2030 in line with the SDGs. Number four, it's about food safety and improving nutrition. What I mean by improving nutrition intake is that we need to ensure we're, we're giving you tools, nudging you to make better choices when you eat. And I'll show you some examples of some of the initiatives we have started. Um, number five, it's about enhancing our food um, security response system. So because we are very much uh, independent on imports, we are very much dependent on the global food supply chain. So we need to be ready for disruptions in the global food supply chain and have plans B and C ready so that when there is a disruption, we have plans in place so that everyone still has accessibility of food. Now with any strategy, you have the strategic directions and these are the enablers. A food security governance model, and uh, alhamdulillah, uh, end of December, the cabinet approved the Emirates Food Security Council, which I'm honored to, to lead, uh, along with my colleagues from the different ministries and local authorities who all have some role to play in the food security domain. Um, the R&D agenda, this is about aligning uh, all research and development that's being done in the UAE when it comes to food security. And this is where, of course, we hope to also work more closely with uh, Professor Jamal Sawadi and his team at the Emirates uh, Center for Strategic uh, uh, Reserve Studies and Reserve and Research. Um, and with that, we want to align everything that everyone's doing on food security so that when somebody wants to do some research or find out some data, they can find it on one platform. Actually, we have just uh, a week ago um, launched the food uh, food research platform, which is now online for everyone to use, and we're going around and making sure universities and study centers and uh, research institutes are putting their uh, research in there so you've got a one-stop shop for R&D. Food security database. We need to ensure that for any policies we have sound data. Any investors need to also know what data, like if I want to grow tomatoes in the UAE, how much are we importing, um, what are the prices in, in the market. So this is a sound database to make sure we have all data related to food security in one place. Human capacity. This is something very very dear to my heart because we, we can enable technology, we can do so many things, but if we don't have the right people 
to use the technology or the right uh, a human capacity to be able to move the things we want to move, then we can't get anywhere. I often, when I talk to the youth in any youth circles, I, I don't address them as I'm looking for the next farmer. I give them a new name. I said, I'm looking for an agri-technologist. I need to give it a cool spin. I need to give it something that the youth can see. Oh, this is really exciting. I think I want to do this. So um, uh, the fifth one is food movement. And what we mean here is how we can shift a behavior change, how we can shift the way we're eating now. We're, we're very much about fast and convenience. Families don't spend time in the kitchen anymore. Families don't spend quality time sitting together and socializing when they're eating. Um, so there's a lot we have to do in, in changing our, our behavior, which, which takes time, because this is also a culture shift as well. So with that, this is the, the plan. And uh, this is a glimpse on the Emirates Food Security Council, just to show you who is uh, within the council. So these are all the ministries and uh, representatives from local governments and also representatives from the youth to make sure that we are all implementing the strategy and discussing anything related to food uh, on a holistic approach. And uh, we've got, this is the new logo of the Emirates Food Security Council. Now I want to talk about adopting technology. Now, something that was really important um, for the private sector, when I first took this file, I saw that we weren't adopting ag tech or agriculture technology as fast as I would like to see it. So I gathered the private sector and I said, what are the barriers that we have in the system that we have to remove so that you can adopt ag tech faster? And it was really an exciting time for me because <laughs> Okay, we had over 100 challenges that time when I did the think tank with them. So I got the dairy sector together, the aquaculture, the, 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 the horticultural sector together, and I asked each of them, what are the barriers? From these 100 barriers, we selected seven which came across all of them. I'll give you an example. If somebody wants to set up a farm uh, to grow, let's say, uh, capsicum, they said, I, have, I need six or seven licenses for me to open up this company. This is a lot on, on someone who's just starting. It's a big capex cost just for the licensing fees. So we made sure that we said one of the solutions we have to do is to make one unified agriculture license across the UAE, which has all the legal activities, so that anyone who undertakes something that's food producing has it all under one license. So this is just an example of one of them. And we used the government accelerator for it, and we called it the Ag Accelerator. And with that, uh, uh, in the presence of His Highness, we launched 10 initiatives. And in a way, we opened up a new economic sector for the UAE, removing some just basic barriers that were in the system. So there were no ag tech building codes, for example. So if someone wanted to set up a farm in a closed system, there was no standards for it. So now there are standards. There's a unified agricultural license. We also got the finance sector to help put an agricultural loan guarantee together. So these are a few of the um, uh, initiatives that we launched, and we did this with the private sector, so I suddenly had 100 employees, and in 100 days we were able to launch these initiatives. Um, and now you see these kind of technologies in the UAE, where we've got two, uh, two high-tech greenhouses uh, using vertical farm system, we've got advanced robotics, we've got aquaculture RAS systems, these are growing now salmon, sea bass, sea bream, hamour, uh, shrimps and uh, what's coming up soon is as well, sigil, cobia as well. So we're seeing a lot of new technologies that are being enhanced for the environment so that we can actually grow a lot of our food in the UAE. What do I mean now by advancing R&D, which was the third direction given by His Highness? I just want to show you again the political will behind why it's, uh, so we all know you are the the Emirates Center for Strategic uh, Studies and uh, Research, how important research and development is. So Abu Dhabi rolls out one billion dirham incentive scheme to support agri-tech uh, companies. We also had an announcement, Emirates Airlines is now building the world's largest vertical farm for its own needs. So Emirates Catering Group, they, um, they need to make 250,000 meals a day 
And with that, they use a lot of perishable items, such as leafy greens and tomatoes. And they found now it's commercially more viable for them to have their own farm than to buy from the market. Okay, so we can see now technology is now becoming, it's becoming more commercially viable to grow your own food. And um, the last I've heard is that hopefully by Expo, the farm will be ready and the first harvest will come out of it. Um, also another announcement made by His Highness, uh, uh, the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi, and that the UAE will be investing uh, 5.6 billion uh, dirhams into R&D for water security and food security as well. So these, I had one more research, yes, the new research authority formed in Abu Dhabi has also identified these five areas as priority areas and food security is one of them. This is just to show you these are all announcements made in the last few months showing that the UAE is now putting a lot more effort in the R&D domain, which is something we were a little bit lacking uh, in previous years. I wanted to share with you some of the initiatives that our office have taken. Um, one thing we have to remember, food security is not only a government and private sector responsibility. It's all of us, every single one of us. Our decision we make when we go to the supermarket, what we cook at home, how we cook at home, what we put in the bin, all affects the food security of the country. And so we launched a food tech challenge in the presence of His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum to act as a catalyst to, en to encourage communities and individuals to look into what food security is and how we can solve some of our challenges on the community and household level. So um, I think so far we've had about 1,000 registrations. From them, uh, about 450 have qualified as being um, analyzed, and hopefully in April we'll be announcing the winners. So we really, what's really great about this is we got the whole world thinking to solve some of the issues we have in the food supply chain for hot, arid countries such as the UAE. And Another thing that the cabinet approved last year as well was the nutritional labeling policy. I don't know how many of you are nutri nutritionists out there, but if I look at a label, a food product, and go to the supermarket, I don't know if two grams of sugar is high or three grams of salt is at high or low. So with this, you, we actually have given you a tool to be able to make a better choice because red will mean this is high Orange will mean this is, don't have too much of it. And green means you're okay to have this or more quantities of this. So this is uh, at the moment voluntary and in January 2022, it will be compulsory. Okay, so this is the kind of nudging we're trying to do with the, with the community. We also worked with the UAE University on an industry open day. This was an initiative we did to try and get the students to have some hands-on experience on what ag tech is in the UAE. So we brought ag tech companies from the UAE. They all did a kind of TED talk presentation to the students saying what they're actually doing, what they're producing and with what technologies. The students had a chance to ask questions. And at the end, all the companies, these are all UAE based companies, uh, signed a pledge saying any of you students who wants to come and do work experience in your spring holidays, summer holidays, winter holidays, you're welcome to do so. And in that way, we're, we're sort of doing the matchmaking, but also giving the students a taster of what it is in working in ag tech nowadays. So these are just some glimpses of the... the we also worked with the Ministry of Health to make a national nutritional guideline. This is something very important because there's so much information in the internet. What can we eat? What's good for us? What should the macronutrients be? What's the percentage? We also, in the Gulf countries, we have different DNA than other countries. So we needed to understand what makes sense to eat in the environment we're in. So with all those efforts, alhamdulillah, we were able to jump 10 spots on the Global Food Security Index. Now, His Highness, uh, Sheikh Hamad bin Rashid, always tries to make sure that there is a competitive index with which we're comparing ourselves to so that we can compare ourselves with other countries. This Global Food Security Index is an, an index that's hosted by The Economist, the intelligence uh, unit of The Economist. 
And when we started, we were ranked 31. Our aim was, by 2021, to be amongst the top 10, hopefully to become number one before 2051. And uh, with the efforts we have already put in in the last year and a half, we've been able to jump 10 spots, which is a great achievement. And this was not only because of what we're doing, but it was a unified and a, a joint concerted effort with all the stakeholders. And we're very, for me, it's very important that, uh, His Highness always says, we are nation designers. And being a nation designer, we have to know where it is we want to go to. There needs to be a target. We need to work together. We need to work in partnership. We have now signed also agreements with Saudi Arabia, with Bahrain, all in food security domains to work together because food security is a very important pillar of Gulf security. And we all have similar challenges when it comes to the environment and the climate. And we all have to work together because we will not have this availability of food coming in on a daily basis with all the challenges that are coming up. It won't be as smooth in the future. And we're already feeling these disruptions. So it's really important that we have a plan and we start working on it so that in future we also can enjoy food security. Thank you very much. We would like we would like to thank Her Excellency Mariam Al Mahiri for her speech and now the third keynote speech today for His Excellency Major General Staff Bailot Ali Al Ahbabi, Chairman Critical Infrastructure and Coastal Protection Authority. On his behalf, Brigadier uh, Rashid will say Bismillah Rahman in name of Allah. Your Excellency Jamal Al-Suwaidi, Chairman of ECSSR, our dear attendees, good morning. I would like to thank you very much for this kind invitation to participate in this symposium organized by your center, talking about the Gulf security, confronting the challenging. Always, you definitely organize useful symposium in order to talk about the different challenges in the GCC. And as you know, there is different conflicts happening and there is now the Gulf area a state for all these conflicts. And that will have impact because the GCC area is an important trade route. All these concerns that happening in the sea of the Arabian Gulf, we have seen vessel attack and also petrol facilities attacks and the threat to close Hormuz Strait in front of all the trade and the international trade. The different, the different military balance is now difficult by time. And so the security of marine very important now to secure in order to impact all the international agreement in this area regarding the security of the marine and also to save the different facilities for energy and water or even the gas pipelines to different islands and that in coordination with different federal and governmental establishment and in participation with different army sectors. The geostrategic location of the GCC is very important, especially in the international trade and also shaping the relationship between the countries. In addition to the different treasures in the area that have impact on the international stage. And for that, different countries they are competing in this area to achieve the highest interest and also that pushed the countries in the GCC area to defend itself by building the capacity and being more attention to the army capacity in order to achieve their security in the area. It's clear, it's very important to have a security system 
in order to protect the vessels and ships in the Arabian Gulf area. This is important not only for the GCC but also for the international maritime because that have impact on the security, economical and social society level. And for that, we here talk about the security of the UAE. We have, we have taken different military and also political procedures according to the regional and international agreements in order to protect our national interests and also facilities and that include the regional, internal, and also the different economical zones. Any attempts to protect this area, that will have impact on the international trade. And for that, the different efforts working together on the regional and international stage is very important to support the international trade in this area because if there is more economical challenges that also will increase the security challenges and here we need to put a strategy to deal with all the challenges including the marine area some different challenges is for example the continuous occupation of the three Emirati islands, Tumbel Kobra, Asura, and Abu Musa, regardless of the development and political efforts to solve the problem and the rejection of all Emirati suggestions to solve it in a peaceful manner. And that also escalated the situation and also worked in, in different aspects on the national and international stage. The different military also actions in the Arabian Gulf and also doing the different maneuvers with modern military and showing the power and that threaten the, the international stability and sending different negative messages to the GCC countries and developing cruise anti-vessels missiles or even the drones using war using on behalf war strategy by using the different militias out of their region in order to extend the power on the account of the GCC countries and shaping different or multinational militias that have loyalty to different countries and also to threaten the stability and that will have great expenses and it's clear here the international existence here in order to protect the the sea and we can see it here by the different threatens in hormones straits and blocking the the petrol trade in the region and that will harm different countries. For that, the whole international countries pay attention to this area. The international agreements put different security measures and send troops in order to protect the safety of vessels in the Arabian Gulf. The increased role for Russia and also Turkey, and that increased the non-stability position in the region and also the skeptic role for the United States and also doing actions with Iran and we have seen that between Iran, Syria and Hezbollah militia. These are some of the challenges. Time is here short in order to speak about all of these but we want to indicate the different how the UAE faced that. Here we say the UAE go along with the approach with peaceful approach in order to use policy political solutions and diplomacy but with the same challenges continues definitely that will have security and economical impact that impact on the stability of the region including iran and also on the international economy 
because it's very important to guarantee the free of, of shipping and navigation in, in the uh, Hormuz Strait and the exporting, oil exporting countries with the increased uh, possibility for conflicts. All these challenges have impact in building the capacity, the military capacity for the GCC countries by buying modern weapons with different countries in addition to joining different international alliances to face these challenges. I would like to finish my speech. In front of these challenges, it's very important to work together internationally in order to protect the Arabian Gulf as the security and economy is very important for a humanity, especially when we talk here about the different economical aspects and that will have impact on a peace building approach. Thank you very much for your attention and have a lovely day. Thank you. And now we start uh, continue the symposium of Gulf security, confronting the challenging the challenges. And now we will talk about the geopolitics. Mr. Hussein Al Harmuzi will speak, will be a panel chair. Our dear guests, good morning. We are pleased to meet you today in the symposium of Gulf security, confronting the challenges. And I would like to welcome our guests in this session, talking about the geopolitics of the Gulf region. From USA, Mr. Eric Fandro, the U.S. Navy Senior Fellow, Atlantic Gia Wal Amn, a Tabi Al Majlis Al Atlasi, a Ladi Amal Muakaran Fi Hayat Al Arkan Al Mustaraka, Bewazar Al Defa Al Marikia, Dabita Rukunin, Mutahasasan Fi Ibtal Al Dahar Al Mutafajara. Was he a Dutnal Said Eric, and Al Amn Al Bahri Al Khaliji, with Tahdidat Li Rania? Ahlan Bik Said Eric. Women Al Mamluk Al Arabia Saudia. الأستاذ خالد الزعتر الكاتب والمحلل السياسي والباحث في شؤون الشرق الأوسط وصاحب مؤلفات عدة منها كتاب إيران الخميني شرطي الغرب وكتاب الدويلات العربية ودولة إسرائيل الكبرى وكتاب التنظيم القطري التراكمات التاريخية وعقدة المساحة والبحث عن الزعامة وسيحدثنا الأستاذ الزعتر عن السياسة الخارجية التركية في المنطقة أهلا بك أستاذ خالد ونبدأ مع السيد إريك فراندروب كوماندر فراندروب we have uh, 15 minutes your floor is yours sir good morning I first like to thank the Emirates Center for Strategic Studies and uh, research for inviting me allowing me to come here and uh, speak with you and share my, share my thoughts and uh, I will put out the disclaimer as a, as a U.S. military person, uh, these, uh, this presentation reflects uh, my thoughts alone and doesn't represent those uh, specific to uh, the United States Navy or the Department of Defense or the U.S. government, but uh, just of my own. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, maritime security in the Gulf today, just to give you a snapshot of what I intend to discuss. I'll put it in the context of oil as a major export in the region. Uh, I'll uh, focus uh, a lot of uh, my talk on uh, the threats that Iran possesses, uh, specifically their naval capabilities. And then I'll talk about some of the ways uh, the U.S. and various other maritime partnerships in the region are uh, providing maritime security. And then finally, I'll offer um, a proposal of a study uh, moving forward and how we can better um, do, uh, conduct maritime security together uh, in the future. So for context, from 2016 to 2018, approximately 20 million barrels of oil per day passed through the Strait of Hormuz, which as previously mentioned represents approximately 20% of global oil production. 
And to put it in context for some of the GCC countries specifically, oil makes up approximately 50 percent of, of GDP for both Kuwait and Qatar, and it is a major component for the other four countries. So what does this mean? It means the safeguarding of the flows of oil and other commerce, both in and out of the Strait and through the Gulf, will remain a priority for the Gulf countries. And comparing the Strait of Hormuz to some of the other maritime choke points globally, you can see here that the Strait of Hormuz has the highest in the world. With the context of maritime security and, and Iran, I'd like to point out a couple things. First, um, obviously the proximity of Iran to the Gulf, the entire eastern shore, uh, allows Iran to quickly project forces or power, both naval forces or air power, um, and that's an, adva an advantage for them. Um, and secondly, and maybe uh, more indirectly, but maybe more important, um, I Iran's aspirations to become a regional hegemon, specifically in their use of non-state proxies, uh, for example, the Houthis in Yemen, Hezbollah in Lebanon, um, all of this, their uh, malign actions of those actors and the malign actions of Iran in general throughout the region have more or less pressurized the entire Gulf region and has brought pressure to the, uh, to the, uh, the maritime realm of the Gulf itself. Moving forward to military capabilities of Iran, uh, they have just over 600,000 active duty members of their military of which approximately 38,000 belong to their naval forces. And that's comprised of both the IRIN, which primarily operate outside of the Gulf, and the IRGCN, which primarily operate within the Gulf. As far as their capabilities go, they have a wide array of both asymmetric and conventional military capabilities. I'll talk a little bit more about each of these but tr traditional naval assets, ships, submarines, and aircraft. But they uh, also have some asymmetric capabilities, um, specifically when you look at uh, cyber capabilities and electronic warfare capabilities. Perhaps at the core of Iran's naval force and coastal defense is their fleet of small boats. Fast attack craft and fast inshore attack craft possess various weapons and patrol throughout the Gulf region. And they're often seen harassing both uh, military vessels and merchant vessels. Iran uh, uh, has a submarine fleet, um, not notably comprised of uh, three kilo class Russian submarines, with addition, uh, additionally uh, some smaller submarines. Um, and of note, there are operating constraints within the Gulf, uh, being uh, with the depth limitations, it is uh, limiting in how they can utilize uh, submarines, especially their larger ones within the Gulf itself. Iran has a vast inventory of naval mines and uh, what we refer to as limpet mines or magnetically attached mines, uh, similar to the ones we saw uh, placed on the merchant vessels uh, late last year. But uh, to accompany their, their mines, they also have a wide array of uh, vessels that can quickly employ them. And I would even go as fast to say that they could employ them without really anyone even noting or noticing. Obviously, these mines would hinder maneuverability throughout the Gulf or can disrupt, disrupt maritime traffic altogether, depending on how they're emplaced. Maybe one of the most emerging threats that uh, Iran has used is the use of unmanned aerial vehicles or drones. Historically, they've used these primarily in a reconnaissance role, but recent events and attacks at Saudi Arabia oil facilities indicates that UAVs are being weaponized and will probably continue to be weaponized. Iran possesses a series of coastal defense cruise missiles with ranges that span the Gulf in its entirety. And also a series of ballistic missiles that span ranges 
uh, across the entire region to include Eastern Africa and parts of Eastern Europe. So shifting away to, uh, from the threats, I'd like to take a moment to talk about uh, the U.S. Uh, role in the, in the region. Uh, you, the U.S., the United States, has been in a leading role to some degree to provide more or less a military counterbalance to Iran. The U.S. Navy's fifth fleet is headquartered in Bahrain, along with other key bases in and around the region. Specific to Fifth Fleet, the way that uh, the U.S. task organizes its forces is through a series of task force that are functionally assigned missions. So for instance, some do mine warfare, uh, some do nothing but logistics support, and some do submarine and anti-submarine operations, just to name a few. Now if you'll allow me just for a minute, if you were to take Fifth Fleet out of the, uh, the equation, at least just for one slide, um, I think you'd find this pretty interesting. Uh, in general, if you look at the GCC Naval Forces in aggregate or in total, the GCC Naval Forces generally exceed Iran's, at least in quantity. And while Iran possesses more submarines, the GCC in total possesses significantly more blue water Navy capabilities. In fact, if you look at specifically their surface fleet or their ships, it's almost a two to one ratio over Iran in that regard. And to take it one more step further, just to highlight, in 2018, looking at defense spending, GCC almost spent seven times more on defense than Iran did. 135 billion US dollars versus 20 billion U.S. dollars for Iran. And I'll caveat, just be, the spending alone doesn't necessarily translate to capability or effects, but at least gives a glimpse of the promise that the uh, GCC naval power can bring um, when, when combined. I'd like to take a moment to talk about some of the ways that security cooperation is conducted today in the Gulf. First, uh, the Combined Maritime Forces is a partnership of 33 nations, also headquartered in, in Bahrain. Uh, they've been in place since the early 2000s, but they're broken up into a few different task forces that uh, look at maritime security within the Gulf, maritime security in the waters around the region, the Red Sea, the Gulf of Oman, and then they also have a counter-piracy mission as well. More recently, back in Last year, late last year, the U.S. led an initiative to stand up the International Maritime Security Construct, which was in the wake of the, uh, the merchant vessels being attacked. Uh, and this was a, an initiative to help support um, providing maritime security in and out of the Strait of Hormuz. And finally, there is a, a initiative, a uh, French-led initiative that is a European security initiative that has been in place uh, really just since last month and includes uh, eight nations, all from Western Europe. So with that in mind, in light of what Fifth Fleet is doing in the region, the existing maritime partnerships that are in the region oper operating, even unilateral operations, and in, spite, or in light of the evolving Iranian threat, I think we ought to be looking at this problem collectively, both the GCC and the, and, U, and the U.S. and other stakeholders to counter what Iran is doing. And I'll pose a question, is the status quo of what we're doing, does it suffice? I think, there's mutually uh, I think it's mutually beneficial to take a holistic look across the region to see if there's better ways to conduct maritime security. And in order to do that, I would argue that there is a general lack of understanding across across the board, really, of the constraints and restraints that individual nations have when contributing to a maritime security mission. For example, um, under having an understanding of training shortfalls for their naval forces, or capabilities or capability gaps that a naval force may have. Maybe there's spending constraints within their ministers of defense, or maybe there's legal objections or legal hurdles that have to be overcome 
or maybe there's bilateral or multilateral security cooperation or information sharing agreements that, that uh, are in place that make it difficult to work together. I would argue that there's, there's not a great understanding across the community as a whole to be able to overcome and work together more coherently. So what I'm offering is a study that the Atlantic Council, the organization I come from, um, is considering doing, and that's taking a holistic look across the region to look at some of these and not only identify them, but maybe even look at opportunities for uh, GCC countries in general to take more of leadership roles. Uh, not that the U.S. Um, would instantly leave, but uh, the U.S. could maybe be more in a U.S. Um, uh, leadership role to enable a uh, GCC uh, maritime security effort. So I think, in conclusion, it's in the interest of all GCC countries and the U.S. to have a stable gulf and a free flow of commerce throughout the region. Um, I would be interested in hearing your thoughts either in this forum or off to the side afterwards and uh, the promise that maybe a study like this can have. And with that, I thank you for your time. شكرا للسيد اريك فراندرب على هذه الورقة الثرية حقيقة التي لفتت النظر الى التدخل الايراني في عمليات الملاحة في مضيق هرمز وفي المناطق المحيطة به واثارت تساؤلا في غاية الاهمية حول افضل السبل لحماية الملاحة في هذه المنطقة الحساسة والان ننتقل الى الاستاذ خالد الزعتر استاذ خالد لديك 15 دقيقة فلتتفضل مشكورا How are their guests? Good morning. I would like to thank the ECSSR for the kind invitation and for this important topic about the Turkey's foreign policy in the region, taking into consideration the different changes as the Turkey policy now is moving from respecting the different agreements and now moving to more expansion more chaos more use of militias in the region the external policy for turkey went through three stages the first one is isolated from the middle east and that happened in the turkey country before after the caliphate the second one is the openness turning to the Middle East and that was prominent with Hizb al-Adal al-Tanmiya party in, in, the, in power that economical Turkey now suffered before that happened so all the Western studies put Turkey in two choices to collapse or even now turning to the Middle East and being open and improving the relationship with the Middle East forming the Turkey Arab Forum and also the Arab GCC with Turkey Forum and that helped in improving the Turkey economy by 6% in 2001 after a shrinking 5.6% so Turkey benefited economically with the openness to Middle East. And when we speak about the third stage, which is the isolation that Turkey now is living because of its policies, which we can say it's violent. So when we look to Turkey, they moved from the Arabic Spring in openness and improving the relationship to now they are violent, they are using violent policy, focusing on the new Khalifa project. When we review the policy in the Middle East, we need to indicate an important board 
when Ahmad Dawood Oglo speech or book, he said the importance of relationship and value from its strategic and historical position. And here, Turkey needed to make use of its history in the foreign policy. So the book of Ahmad Dawood Oglo is now the engineer for the external policy. And also it's the engineer for the new Khalifat project, which is based on the existence of military, Turkey military in the region. And it come within the power of Turkey. So Turkey now is dealing with the Middle East, as we say, improving the relationship, fighting role in different conflict and intervene in peace, especially with the Syrian-Israeli negotiation. They, they launched the negotiation. Mr. Rajab Tayyip Erdogan, when he was the Prime Minister, said he is ready to exchange the messages personally between the parties. But now, within the Arabic Spring, we see different action from Turkey to have more power, political power, and also to support the Islamic Brotherhood in, in Egypt in order to regain the Uthmani Caliphate and to make Turkey power in the different countries because they are tools to spread their power. After Islamic Brotherhood collapsed in Egypt, which is a great shock for Turkey, now they have the military power where the, the where Daesh or ISIS exists in north of Syria. So they invested in Islamic Brotherhood and ISIS and numbers can indicate 30,000 of ISIS went through Turkey lands and Turkey also give the financial support to ISIS as an alternative for Islamic Brotherhood to achieve military governance within the countries as we see in the north of Syria so they deal with North Turkey not to fight terrorism, but to spread the Turkey policy in Syria and to make the ID, especially in Libya, to export the Turkish model to the Libyan land. As we have seen, transferring the militias from Syria to Libya. So Tur Tur uh, Turkey lost a lot of power they achieved in the Middle East and now they are suffering 30%. They lost 30% of the value of their currency and it came down to 32% which is considered a big loss for the Turkey regime. Erdogan always very proud of the Turkey, of the economical situation in his country, but now it's different. The Turkish policy now participated in playing with the different achievement that they have. After now the, the big role in peacemaking and the good relation with the GCC countries in the past, now Turkey start to move and to lose their relationship with Egypt and the GCC countries. The foreign policy for Turkey now how we can face it, how we can face the Turkey chaos, 
and to force to force them to retreat and to make it a normal country. We can't say it's easy to deal with Turkey and or even even Iran. So we need to face both of them. Especially when we look at Turkey and Iran, they have unified the project, extended project to make use of policy and make use of, poli of mil militias to turn our I Arabic ID to Pharisee or even Turkey ID so the GCC countries, Arab countries, regional ones succeeded in isolated the Irani regime and to withdraw to get back as we have seen in Yemen and Syria we need to deal with Turkey in the same way as we deal with Iran because we they have similar projects it's based on hate toward anything that is Arabic so it's very important as we say to review the policy as Today, there is a big harmony if we review the speech of Erdogan. He said Iran is considered an important country. It's not just a compliment, but it reflects the, the Turkish Irani aliens to target the Arab countries. And they start to lose with the Arab, with the GCC countries because of their policies. And they are now turning their back to the Arab to face the Irani. It's very important to see how the Turkey now they are losing their relationship with the Arab countries, especially the GCC countries. We can't we can't say the importance of the GCC country is not much. So, the foreign policy, the Turkish foreign policy now, again went into isolation. As we have seen in 2001 and 2002, improving the relationship with Syria and Iraq. And even shaping the forum, the Arabic-Turkish forum, again start to lose all its power. ما بين مصر وما بين تركيا بخاصة في ظل and that happened again in in intervention of Turkey in Egypt and supporting the Egyptian Islamic Brotherhood the Turkish regime they have a great interest with Iran and that lose the importance of Turkey talk very close to my which is very important especially when we make use with the interest with the GCC countries and retrieve the importance of Turkey in the GCC country so again three straits isolation from the Middle East then openness and turning to the Middle East which is considered the golden age for Turkey and it served the Turkish economy. Especially now they are trying to seek out how to get out of the isolation and to seek out their Turkish ID. Again, now we are in the isolation which Turkey now is living in the Middle East. Especially now the Turkish regime is making use of the different militias and investing in chaos so they are similar to Iran and they have two choices either to live in isolation as they are in now or even the economical collapse under the banality that Iran is living under or even changing 
the current people in the Turkish regime, and we have seen indicators for that since Istanbul election, where the governing party lost some lands and some cities, not only in Istanbul, but also that led in the big loss and the dissemination of the governing party and that led to accusing Erdogan of these all losses. So the change now is very crucial in Turkey and it's a matter of time. We will see it in the next election because Istanbul is considered very important for any election that's happening in Turkey. And that reflects the speech of Erdogan he said, if we, if we lose Istanbul, we will lose the, uh, Turkey. And here we see the suffering of the governing regime. And we ha it's evident in their conflict with the different countries in the GCC or in the Arabic regime. Thank you very much for your attention. Shukran, <laughs> Ustad. Thank you, Mr. Khaled, for this paper that dealt with the more Turkish motivations to open on the Middle East area. And this is in, in preparation for the uh, Ottoman Khalifa and in preparation for political hegemony where the, uh, national, the Islamists got told of the power there. Now we will uh, hope we will start our discussion here and anyone has a, a question could pose that question but first introduce him or herself. Any, uh, yes, uh, yes, sir. Dr. Hassan Sveti uh, at, from uh, yeah, Emirates University. I've enjoyed everything. You had no paper or nothing. And this strong audience here. I, I have a question here as, about the, the Turkish role, the military role in the Gulf area. Could you give us some details about the power of this presence in the area in case of a crisis. Uh, thank you very much. We can talk about the military role in the, Gulf, the Arab Gulf area. This comes in the context of the expansionist Turkish program here to control the area, militarily control the Gulf area. Turkey invested a lot in the uh, Qatari crisis and had its presence in, on the Qatari land. This presence is not that different from uh, previous Turkish uh, policies uh, in establishing their bases in like in Somalia and others. Their, Turk, their military expansionist policies and is well known. I think the uh, Turkish role in its uh, military presence in the area like in the Gulf I think it doesn't serve the security in the region here because it is this presence is it serves the expansion, expansionist uh, program, the Turkish program here project in the area, and they are trying here to jump over its geographical period uh, borders and have their existence in Qatar. And we know that the Qatari regime uh, hasn't learned from previous experiences. When, the, when we had uh, the military presence during the caliphate, the Ottoman caliphates, when they tried to negate the emirate role here there. And then we, as we see that the, in the previous, we, we, we see that Qasim al Thani resigned and left Doha because of the pressure from Turkey. And we know that wherever there is a, a Turkish presence, they try to 
achieve their goals and aspirations. Now we believe that the, um, the Qataris made a mistake when they brought the, um, the, uh, the Turkish troops into the, uh, onto their land, and that doesn't serve the, the Gulf area. We know that the Turkish, when, when the Turkish government has stopped uh, the, their dealings with the American with, with confrontation with Egypt, now they move to other areas like the Gulf here to have their political and military presence. They are trying to you know, to have their presence here to serve their project, and that's well known through their dealings and activities. In the midst of the uh, economic uh, sanctions that Iran is witnessing and the huge curtailment in their economy, how is that translating? Would that have an impact on their maritime activities going forward? Yeah, I think. Um that pressure campaign that uh, has been put on them, um, it's got to be calculated because too much pressure puts their back against the wall, um, but not enough pressure maybe doesn't give them the message. So uh, I, th I think that's, uh, that's something that we always have to weigh, um, observe the geopolitical um, scenarios that, that are playing themselves out, but uh, it's, it's a well-calculated decision that you don't want to um, get things to escalate too quickly, but get the message across. Thank you, sir. Any questions? Yes. One question for uh, Frederick. Frederick, uh, my question is a mostly military question. A little All bit. right. Uh, so I will start. Although there is a tension between the U uh, United States and Iran, the Arabian Gulf, and uh, I don't think they are looking for uh, any confrontation between both the countries. Also, the G GCC countries are not looking. Do you think that the solution for the GCC country is to build a force similar to the uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guard so they can deter their force, uh, especially in the tension of uh, the security in the Arabian Gulf? Is it uh, some solution for them? And uh, my second question to regarding the Suali uh, al Turkey. Uh, about Turkey. Here, Turkey faces uh, confrontations with Iran and, and the Mediterranean. Uh, they have some problems with European countries, especially when we talk about Cyprus. Uh, is uh, Turkey capable of working on two fronts here, the European one and then the uh, area here, especially when the European community is stepping off way from them? Will the European community allow them to be the leaders here? So I think, to answer your question, no. I don't think there needs to be a force that needs to be built in kind to match um, Iran's. Um, for example, um, I would argue personally that um, you don't need submarines to defeat or uh, be as effective um, or counter Iran submarines. Um, I think there's other ways that you can that you can do that with assets that don't involve, involve submarines. So that's just one, one example. But uh, I guess that goes more to the point of having a mutual understanding and looking at the collective um, nature of all the uh, the GCC naval forces and, uh, and, and leveraging the strengths because everybody brings strengths to the table that can counter Iran in, in various ways, and leveraging those strengths and building a framework of cooperation um, and building it out and forecasting out, okay, what areas as a GCC uh, force do we lack capability or we lack abilities to deter them or defend in this area? And until you have that, it's hard to build your force collectively as a, as a GCC set of uh, countries. Uh, as for Turkey, we see they moved from the dealing with the problems here in the region or international regions to now to creating problems. And the Turkish regime is facing a problem, and I think it is the, the beginning of the demolition of it. And the, the, what's happening in Syria nowadays, the confrontations between the Syrian regime supported by Russia, 
and the Turkish uh, troops there shows the shows that the, the uh, countries of yesterday uh, will, uh, in relation to the Syrian file has become enemies. Now the Turkish uh, regime has lost a lot and now they are uh, facing problems on many fronts. They create and, and this is uh, makes their isolation stronger. And this is the beginning of the collapse of the uh, Turkish regime. This regime that cannot uh, have a presence on different fronts, front, especially in the economic situation, the poor economic situation in Turkey. Brigadier Lua Ahmed Said bin Break from southern Yemen. My question is the mutual uh, cooperation between uh, Turkey and Iran in uh, concerning the war in Yemen and the continuation of Yemen and the escalation of it uh, recently uh, through from the unlimited support provided to the Houthis and what what is the impact on the continuation of the war there and the second one is the the not known position of the international uh, uh, system and when we talk about the security council and their negative or passive, passive stance towards the situation in Yemen. When we talk about cooperation and, and coordination between Yemen, uh, uh, Turkey, and, and Iran concerning the fall in Yemen is meant to keep the confrontation with countries in the Gulf, especially a country like Saudi Arabia. And now we know that in 2014, the Turkey and Iran had a, started an alliance between them after the confrontation with the Qataris here. And after Turkey uh, manipul used all available resources to, to it here. Now we know that Turkey moved to what we think of as investing in groups like Houthis, terrorist groups like Houthis, and they have countries like Qatar and Turkey, they have the same goals. And this, the, the goal is the continuation of the war through support or to provided to Houthis against the Arabic world. We see the Arabic alliance uh, here led by the Saudi Arabia, is not only concerned with the, uh, the Yemeni file, it is about the whole Arab, uh, the, the, the different Arab files. And we move from condemnation discourse into a different type of uh, confrontation. We move to uh, uh, this important stage in the Arab, active, uh, Arab uh, work. Now we're talking about the Houthi terrorists here. The support they get, and when we talk about this, also brother uh, uh, Muslims here, they they have their own collaboration, and now what we think is that the international community here is not taking a strong pos position when dealing with the situation in the Arab world, and they are not uh, managing it towards a solution, but uh, toward. Uh, keeping this uh, situation as it is. When we look at the situation in Syria, we see it represents the, the failure of the international system. And also because it doesn't support the Arabic position on working on a solution, peaceful solution. And also when dealing with Iran, we see that the same thing, we, 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 we they think of the hoping to have a, 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 a rational approach in, within Iran, but that's not happening. 
And now, as you see, what is happening, what the, the role they play in Iran is similar to what happened in Syria. That's enough uh, for now, and we move to uh, take a break for 10 minutes, and then we will, after it, we continue with the second session. Thank you very much. Mas there is, oh, sorry, sorry, there is no, no, no break now. Thanks to everybody. Now we move to the second session under the uh, development challenges in the Gulf, and I leave you with Mr.